1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So at this point, the Apostle Peter continues his letter by addressing the church. I want you to notice that he begins by speaking to the elders of the church. Notice how he begins. He's speaking to the elders of the church as a fellow elder. Now, briefly, and I say this only because sometimes people may be a little confused because he's using the word elder. He's not speaking of the aged, the elderly. He's not speaking to me. <laughs> Actually, he is. He's not speaking to the older people in general. He's speaking to the leaders who are holding the position of elder in a church. And what he's doing is he's giving them instructions concerning how they're to minister. And so he's designating their duties, he's challenging their motives, and he's pointing to rewards. That's what we'll be seeing. Now, he begins with the elders because they're to shepherd Jesus' sheep. They are what are called overseers. And so he's encouraging, he's exhorting them to perform their duties. Now, when you're looking at elders in a church, in an organized body, church elders are ordinarily the older and more mature members of that fellowship. Now, sometimes the older ones in the fellowship may not be that old chronologically. When our church first began, we had a young church. I was a young pastor. I was 30 years old when we began our church. And uh, so I was young. And so we had to start a, a, um, a ministry for the older members of the church. We called it the over 40s. <laughs> and so you can see that with age, with age of the church the church also ages in chronological age. And so when you begin your ministry, when you begin the church, you're going to normally be looking for the ones who are older or uh, sober-minded and mature in the faith. And, and so what he's speaking about here are the leaders of the church. And again, uh, ordinarily, the, the more mature members. Um, in general, uh, normally with age will come experience and with experience, when, when these things occur in Christ, will come biblical wisdom. In, in Job chapter 12, verse 12, it, it reads, With aged men is wisdom, and in length of days understanding. So in general, respect in the culture, as well as the scriptural mandate, in general, respect was given to those who were older, who were the aged. Again, that's rooted in biblical command. So in a general way, looking at the cultural and, and scriptural mandates as it relates to um, those who are in general older, um, respect would normally be given. Leviticus 19.32 says, You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God. I am the Lord. So I was taught as a kid that when somebody older, and for me, older was like my parents' age. So when someone older came into the room, I wonder how many of you were taught the same way. I, I always was taught to stand. We always stood. When an older person entered into the room, we stood. And that's because my parents had taught me, and they weren't even Christians. It was part of their cultural background that you show respect to those who are the elders, who are the older ones. So that's a general thing, and that comes through Scripture. But just because somebody's older doesn't automatically mean that they're wise it's been said there's no fool like an old fool, and sometimes there's some truth to that. In Job 32, verse 9, it says, Great men are not always wise, nor do the aged always understand justice. So in general, respect should be shown to those who are older. Courtesy should be extended as well as kindness and understanding. If you're in a bus for some reason and somebody needs a seat, you know, we, especially we men, ought to stand up and give the seat to somebody. We ought to just show general kinds of courtesies to people, respect them. That's a general thing that was cultural, but it's also rooted in Scripture. 
And so we ought to be kind. We ought to be understanding. But in church life, we show respect to the aged who faithfully are servants of the Lord. In Proverbs 16.31, it says, The silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it's found in the way of righteousness. And so in the church, elders are normally chosen again from older men. Elders were not self-appointed. They were chosen, selected to be elders. It didn't come through a vote, though. It came through the prayerful leading of the Holy Spirit because these elders are to be spiritually qualified to lead a church. So when a, when a church is planted, well-qualified leadership must be appointed to oversee the work of the Lord. And there needs to be a, a system of biblical authority. So the most experienced and mature believers are to watch over and instruct others. And the authority is vested scripturally in the elders. You'll see that in the early church, Acts 14, 23. It says, when they, speaking of Paul and Barnabas, had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so the church is spiritual, and its leaders must be spiritually mature also. So as spiritual leaders, they have to have integrity. They need to have humility. That's necessary to lead. And if you wanted to take time to look at 1 Timothy 3 on your own or Titus chapter 1, you'll see the qualifications as an elder or for an elder. And so elders are accountable to God for the spiritual work that they perform. And that's what we're looking at here in chapter 5. So he begins in verse 1 by saying, The elders among you I exhort, I who am, he says, a fellow elder. And so I want you to see something here, and I'm going to develop this, this in layers. I want you to see the humility he's exhibiting as he's approaching these men. He's saying this. He's saying, I'm not presuming superiority. I appeal to you as a co-laborer in ministry. I, I'm speaking to you, in other words, as an equal among equals. And as I do so, I am couching this in, uh, in an attitude of service. Now, Peter could have very easily boasted of his ministry experience. Very easily he could do that. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in a moment that he hints towards it. Remember, he was a first-generation follower of Christ. He was one of the 12. And when you look at the different times that the 12 apostles are mentioned, you'll find it interesting to note that in every one of the lists that names the apostles, every one, in all the Gospels, in the book of Acts, in every one of the lists that names the, the apostles, the Apostle Peter is always the first one mentioned. He's always the first one mentioned. And guess who the last one is who's mentioned? John. No, <laughs> Judas. Ju Judas is the last one. It's interesting to note that the Apostle Peter is always mentioned first. Judas is always mentioned last. Now, the apostle could have pointed to himself as a first-generation follower of Christ, one of the twelve, and obviously in many capacities the leader of the men. But he's speaking as an equal among equals. He's not boasting of his experience. He's one of the twelve, but he's not saying that. He didn't make any special demands for their respect. When, when Paul was speaking in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, when he was speaking to the church of Thessalonica, he said it like this, he said, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. So we didn't seek any glory from you. We didn't seek any honor from you or anybody else, though we are apostles. Peter could have had this mentality. Listen, I walk with Christ. I know what he's like. I spent three years with him. And he could have said, I have authority that none of you have. And yet he doesn't do that. Instead, what he does is he reminds them of his credentials. He, lets them, re he let lets them know where he's come from. And he's not doing so with an in-your-face kind of thing. But he's reminding them of who he actually is. And, and he says, first he says that he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And so the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness. A witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now, a witness is an eyewitness. It's someone who bears testimony of what he knows to be true. So I'm writing as an apostle. I am one who saw the ministry of Jesus Christ firsthand. And I, and I saw him suffer. 
Now, being an eyewitness of the suffering was a requirement for an apostle. You might find that interesting, but being an eyewitness was a requirement. Um, <laughs> today we have those who refer to themselves as apostle. That's very common. In some places, instead of calling them pastor, they call them apostle. Uh, but that would be a term that is not a, a um, that is not a term that is e equal to the actual apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a term that they're using, but they can't use it in the same way. And I, I wouldn't use that term myself because there were different requirements. And one of the requirements to be an actual apostle is uh, that you were a, a witness of the suffering. In Acts chapter 1, you can see this if you take notes. It's Acts 1, 20 through 22. And it, it reads, for, for said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time, the Lord Jesus, went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection." They needed to be a witness of the things Jesus went through, which would have included his death. So as an apostle, he had seen the sufferings of Christ. Remember, he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus agonized in prayer. Jesus left eight of the apostles. Judas had already departed to finish betraying Christ. But he left, I call it eight at the gate. He left eight at the gate. He took three further in. He saw Jesus when he knelt and prayed and sought his father and the great drops of blood. He saw the suffering of Christ here in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was also in the courtyard of Caiaphas when he saw Jesus being led out after being beaten. He saw Christ as he had suffered. And the sufferings of Jesus were deeply embedded in the soul of this apostle. But he also speaks of being a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So I, I saw his suffering, but I also am going to be a partaker of the glory that's revealed when Jesus returns. So Jesus was one who suffered. Peter saw that. But also Peter looks forward to the glory. And he makes it clear that the sufferings that they're going through. And this is key. Remember, from chapter 1 all the way up to this chapter... He's been alluding to the fact that these are people who are suffering from, per, they're being persecuted. And so he's talking about the glory, pointing their eyes towards something beyond what they're enduring at that moment. And he's making it very clear, your sufferings that you're going through, remember, they're temporary. Uh, Paul in Romans 8, 18 said it like this, I consider our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. Again, Paul, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 for our light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory that is far beyond comparison. And so he's speaking of being a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. In other words, when Jesus returns, faithful pastors will be graciously rewarded. And that ought to motivate every pastor. When Jesus returns, will be rewarded. Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, he shall come to be glorified in his saints, to be admired in all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So they're going to be graciously rewarded. Now, when he speaks of glory, he could also be remembering what he had as an apostle seen. He may be referring to the glory of Christ that he saw. Remember on the Mount Transfiguration? It says in Matthew 17, 1 and 2, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as light. He could be speaking concerning the thing that he had seen previously. In 2 Peter, in chapter 1, verse 16, he says this, he said, We didn't follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And so he's laying a foundation for these leaders, for these elders, pastors, and teachers, and he's letting them know that I am an elder addressing fellow elders, 
and I'm an equal amongst equals, and yet at the same time, I hold a rank above you because I've experienced these things that you have yet to experience, and you haven't experienced and never will experience to the degree I did. I saw Jesus on earth. I saw him suffer on earth. And one day we all will see the same thing. We'll see him glorified on earth. And so that anticipation is a, a motivator to, to cause us to be faithful to serve the Lord, that one day we'll see him as he is. We're going to share in the glory of Christ. In Philippians 3, 20 and 21, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. He's going to take this old bag of bones and fat and transform it. That's going to be nice. No more diets. You can eat as many tacos as you want. It's just, it's going to be wonderful. So anyway, he says, I'm a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. He is giving commands and directions to leaders in the church. And he says this, and I'm going to break this down for you. Shepherd the flock of God. That word shepherd, we see it so much. The word shepherd speaks of tenderly caring for. Tenderly care for the flock of God. When he says the flock of God, the sheep belong to the Lord. They're not ours. They're not the shepherds. They're not ours. The sheep are his. And every pastor should feed the sheep, not beat the sheep. And we should tenderly care for the people. Now, Peter is speaking from experience once again. He had been commissioned to do just that. And Jesus called him to lovingly and and carefully uh, feed and lead the sheep. In John 21, remember these scriptures, verses 15, uh, 15 through 17. Uh, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of, of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. How do you demonstrate as a shepherd that you love Jesus? You tenderly care for and feed the sheep of God. You tenderly care for their needs. You have compassion on them. I think that the greatest thing, and I won't, this isn't in my notes, so I have to be careful because I got a lot to say tonight before communion. Uh, so what, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I really feel that every sheep should have, every, every person who's a member of the body of Christ, every person who knows the Lord Jesus Christ and attends a fellowship, and this is a quick thing, I'll say it quickly. I believe that very strongly that the pastor, whether it's this fellowship or any other fellowship, the teacher, whether it's here or somewhere else, is doing a disservice to the church when they're not feeding them the word of God. If you go to a church and don't get a Bible study, you're being ripped off. You're being ripped off. If you go to a church where you bring your Bible but don't have to open it up, because the pastor's maybe going to read a few verses and then go off into la-la land, you know, telling you the things that's on his mind or on his heart. Or, that's not a Bible study. And in our day, a lot of people are caught up with that. In our day, a lot of people wouldn't even know a Bible study uh, because they haven't had one. I really believe the command of Christ is something to be followed. Now, 
In a day when people no longer endure healthy teaching, but heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears, and voluntarily turn themselves from the truth and turn themselves to fables, in that day that we're living in right now, there's a lack of discernment in the body of Christ. And somebody was asked, what do you think is the greatest problem in the church today? What do you think is the greatest problem in the church today? And you know what the answer was? The answer was pastors. Pastors. And this person who was asked is a well-known theologian, but when he was asked, what do you think? He said, pastors. What do you mean pastors? Why would it be pastors? They're not teaching the flock. They're not taking time to cry over, over verses to plumb the depth of them and making them applicable to those who come to be fed. And in, instead of having churches that are centered on Christ, the churches become to be centered on entertainment or centered on popularity or centered on everything but growing in Jesus Christ. And so the commission that God gave to, to, uh, to the Apostle Peter is the same commission he's giving to the, the shepherds. He's telling them, take care of the sheep. Teach them the word of God. You need to shepherd them, tenderly care for them, and feed them. And what do you feed them? You feed them God's word. You teach them, and you feed them, you care for them. And that's what he's saying here. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. So how do they do that? He says, well, he goes, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, not by constraint. He said, do this willingly. Uh, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a job. It, it, it's not something that is... If somebody, if somebody... Oh, I'm getting away from my notes. If somebody uh, is, 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 looks at, at serving the Lord and feeding the sheep as a job, they ought to get a real job and get out of the pulpit. They really should. You know, because there's no, there's no greater joy that a shepherd can have than to see God's children well-fed and living a life that God blesses. There's, hard, there's nothing more wonderful. It, it causes you great joy to see God's children uh, being blessed by God. And, and how are you going to be blessed if you're not taught? You, you see, so he's saying you're not to do this being forced to do it. It's not by constraint, not compulsion. It's not by force. Why? Well, because that, that can reveal simply a fleshly ambition. And, and having to be forced to do that is the kind of attitude that reveals the heart and motives of a false shepherd. I spoke to my own pastor, Chuck Smith, many years ago now. I can tell you when. It was in 1992. Many years ago. And uh, I had asked him a question because Chuck had said at that time, my pastor had said, and he was turning 65, he had said to us that he was going to retire from ministry. Chuck Smith, and he said, yeah, I'm going to read. It was even being announced. He was talking about it, sharing with it, shared with us as pastors in Calvary Chapel and all. And I was having breakfast with him, and I was at a, a pastor's conference and seated across, and we were having conversations concerning those things. And, and later I spoke to him, and I asked him, I said, you know, Chuck, you said you were going to retire, but you never did. You're, you, you know, you're, you're still going. I, I just want to know why did you announce you were going to retire, but you never did? Liar. No, I said, could you? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to take over your church. No, I said, why did you do that? And this is something I have never forgotten. He said this. He said, David, every day I live with Jesus gives me a day of experience I can give to somebody else. He says, I thought 65 was an age you should retire because my generation retired at 65. But the Lord spoke to my heart and made it very clear to me that I have much to offer people because I want to teach them how to follow and love the Lord Jesus Christ. And my own pastor, Chuck, died uh, during the week as he was preparing another study. He never stopped preparing studies. He died in his 80s. He just kept his hand to the plow. And later on, I had spoken to him, and I said, you know, you've been a great example to me in so many things, but you're a bad example in retirement, Chuck. You never taught me when I should do that. And you just laugh because you don't. Those who serve the Lord by constraint, if you will, are serving by constraint, uh, are really more like false shepherds. Isaiah 56, 11 says it like this. They are dogs with mighty appetites. <laughs> they never have enough. They're shepherds who lack understanding. 
They all turn to their own way. Each seeks his own gain. So to serve the Lord as an overseer requires a spirit-fueled desire. It's a calling that is out of love for the Lord and love for his, his sheep. It's not for dishonest gain. It's not by compulsion. It's not so you can get wealthy off of the poor, the sheep who give faithfully to the Lord, and then you take money to live off. It's not that at all. It's something you do with a willingness, with an eagerness. It is not using ministry to steal people's money. It's not using ministry to acquire finances dishonestly. Now, on one hand, it isn't wrong to receive compensation for serving the Lord. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 says it like this. Let him who's taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. 1 Corinthians 9, 14 the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But there are those who use ministry as an excuse to receive compensation. I still, I'll never forget this one uh, TV preacher who was, uh, was boasting about the fact that he was about to buy a new jet. And he was speaking to this other fellow who said, who wants to fly in, in this tube filled with demons? We need our own jets. And I thought, uh, sign me up. No, I thought, that's a, that's a, that's a false teacher. That's a false prophet. And, and they're, they're using people to make money. Second Corinthians 2.17, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. And so he says, you don't use ministry as an excuse for compensation. You do it willingly because you love them. Verse 3, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. So God entrusts shepherds. And this is what he's speaking. He's speaking to these shepherds. And he's saying that God has entrusted you with the care of his children. And you should do that with love. In 2 Corinthians 1.24, Paul said, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy because it is by faith that you stand firm. So again, we feed the sheep, but we don't beat the sheep. I've seen a whole lot of that in my years of serving the Lord where people are mad at the, at the, the people that they're, that they're ministering to. We really have to be careful. On one occasion, James and John requested positions of honor from Christ. We all know that. You know, grant that one of us may sit on your right hand and your left when you come into your kingdom. But Jesus responded in this way. It's found in Matthew 20, 25 through 28. He called them together. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So be an example, he says, to the flock. The elders are to set the tone. The elders are models of maturity. The elders are to be models of godliness. In 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one despise your youth. Be an example to the believers in word, conduct, love, spirit, in faith and in purity. In 1 Corinthians 4, 15 and 16, this is one of my favorite portions of scripture. Though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. Don't be imitating the wrong ones. Imitate me. Many years ago, many years ago, my son David, was in his teens. And he was speaking to me at our house, at home, in home, in the home. And he used a word that was improper. And I looked at him and I said, what did you say? And he repeated it. And I said, we don't use that word. Now, again, we're talking about a teenager. They know everything. <laughs> I said, we, do, we don't use that word. And he mentioned two pastors that he knew. 
and he said, well, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so uses that word. And I looked at him and I said, are they your father? No. Does your father use that word? No. Don't use that word. Imitate me. Imitate my life. Imitate the things that I value. Imitate the things of scripture that you see in your father. That's what you're to do. And the elders of the church, the leaders of the body of Christ, are to be of such quality in terms of their character that people can look at them and they can say, the way he lives is the way I want to live. Why is that? Because God blesses their life. And I want my life to be blessed also. And so he's speaking of this, and he's making it very clear. Imitate. Be, be worthy of imitation. Now, the writer of Hebrews gives three basic insights, and I'm going to read this to you. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Leaders in the church are examples as faithful communicators of the word of God. That's what he's saying. Those who spoke the word to you, they have faithfully communicated God's word. So faithful teaching of God's word is worthy of respect. 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So he says, these are people who are laboring in God's word, but he goes on and says, whose faith follow. Their way of life is to be worthy of imitation. Why? They live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, consider the outcome. Look carefully at their lives, especially as they grow older and come to its conclusion. Look at the fruit of their life. Observe how they live. Watch their life. Was it a well-spent life? Are there regrets? Are there sorrows? Is there grief? The leaders are supposed to be men of ex who, who can lead with example. They, they're to lead with humility. They're to lead with love. They're to be examples to the flock of God. That's how we're supposed to lead. You know, one of the best lessons, and I'll, I'll make it personal for a moment, but one of the best lessons that I think our fellowship a couple of weeks ago learned about, about me as the pastor of the church was when somebody got up, and some of you may have been in the second service two or three weeks ago now, when somebody had gotten up and started walking towards, towards the pulpit and were raising their voice. I couldn't at first hear what they were saying, you know, because it was such a surprise. And as they started walking forward and they were raising their voice about this being a, a den of thieves, and I thought, for sure they don't, John. And, and so, <laughs> but they were, he says, oh, you know John? No, he, but he was yelling. At first I couldn't hear what he was saying. And then as he drew closer, I could hear some of that. And, and some of you, how many of you were there? So I know who I'm talking to. Okay, then the way, the way I handled it, uh, later on people were saying that that was, they were, they were touched by that. Why is that? because I showed him respect, because I was kind to him. And later on, I spoke to him afterwards, explained some things. John went and took him aside, visited, shared with him, opened up his eyes to some of the things he was, that's how you do it. But I didn't realize that the way I responded spoke volumes to those who were watching the response. I didn't, I didn't realize that. I, I really didn't. I just thought, this is how you respond. You show them grace. You show them love. You show them mercy. That, isn't that what you do? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? I, I can tell you there are places where he would have been handcuffed and thrown out. I can tell you that. That's the truth. That's just the truth. They would have been on him and dragged him out. You don't do that. Now, if he's running at me with a knife or something, I'm still quick enough to, <laughs> to throw my wife in front of him. I, I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> that, but people said they saw a side of their pastor that they hadn't seen they only hear when I teach that that's the truth that's how I handle things gently with love that's what Christians do that's what we're supposed to do right that's what we're supposed to do
And there's a tenderness that you have to have. So observe their life. See how they live. See what they do. And then what, what's the re result? And I'm going to give you just a shortened, and I'll pick up next week and give you the more full because I want to have communion. And, and all. But I'll just touch something here. He says in verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that doesn't fade away. Now, Peter is a shepherd. These men are shepherds. But Jesus is the chief shepherd. And all other shepherds are what we today refer to as under shepherds. And leaders look to the reward because they receive it from the chief shepherd. Again, Hebrews 13, 20 tells us the God of peace who through the, the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. So Jesus gives rewards and we are to be ready for his appearing. In Revelation 22, 12, behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And so he'll be giving to us a reward in 2 Corinthians 5:10 we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body whether good or bad so Jesus is the judge and at this seat called the bema seat our hearts and our motives are going to be made manifest that's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 4:5 said judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both, uh, both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Your heart and the reason you actually did those things is going to be openly manifest. You can see somebody and they, oh, what a sweet and loving person that is because they're smiling, but their heart, they're saying, I want to kill you. I, they, it's, it, you, can, you can smile. I've known so many I've been this way myself in the past where you may smile, but inside you're so angry, you're so mad and everything, but you just don't want them to know what you're feeling. Well, God says, I'm going to show your heart. These hidden things are going to be revealed. In 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And so he's speaking of chief shepherd who's going to be giving crowns. And I'll just close with this one here. I'll teach you next week about the five crowns that are found in the New Testament. But here he says you're going to receive the crown of glory. The crown of glory. Your faithful service is going to be rewarded by you being in the presence of God forever. And you, he's saying... You will experience his eternal glory. And I want you to see, verse 4, how he says that this glory will not fade away. I'll close with a couple thoughts. Temporal, temporal, temporary crowns. Well, during the day of the writing, they would give wreaths. And the wreaths were, were, the, were the reward <laughs> symbols of the uh, uh, fact that they had fought the fight, they had won the race or whatever, and they did it lawfully. But the thing is about the wreath that they would receive, and normally it was in like, in the, like Olympic Games or like the, they call them the Isthian Games. They, they would receive this. Everybody fought, everybody competed, but only one got the crown. And again, next week I'm going to give you a lot more about this. And what he's saying here is those crowns that they received, those wreaths, those garlands that were symbols of victory, they, they, they faded away. They withered up. Uh, some of you ladies, perhaps, and, and some of you guys, perhaps, um, you may have, girl, you ladies might have gone as a young lady to 
the prom and your boyfriend or your date bought you um, something to wear. What do they call those things? A corsage. I never bought one. But anyway, <laughs> if I went out and picked a rose from a garden and put a safety pin on it and said, here, a corsage, right? I wonder how many of you saved yours when you were a kid. Some do, some don't. I don't know. Or guys, when you were in weddings, you know, we get something, a boutonniere or whatever. And some guys will actually uh, save those things. Some guys do. <laughs> this guy doesn't. <laughs> but you know how beautiful they were when you bought them. I mean, you go and get an orchid and you give it to the girl as a boy and, and it's beautiful and all of that. But it withers, right? That's the point. He said, as beautiful as it may be, it's really dead. When you cut it off of that, you killed it. And it just takes time for it to show that it's dead. It fades. It isn't permanent. But the crown you get from the Lord is imperishable. It never fades away. It is forever. And the glory that you experience with God is one that lasts forever. I was watching an interview with a former Miss Universe. She's married to Tim Tebow. Some of you may have seen this interview. I saw it just this week. And I thought, that's a great thing to share with the church. She said, you know, it was a wonderful thing to be Miss Universe. She said, but at the end, and she's a believer in Christ, she said, at the end of my year reign as Miss Universe, which is kind of an amazing thing, that in this entire universe, you're the most beautiful woman, but that's, that's something different. <laughs> um, amazing. But she said, at the end of the year, I had to give the crown back. She was saying that. Now, she's a Christian. She says, but I have a crown that I never will give back. It's an imperishable crown, and it's coming, obviously, from Jesus Christ. So you can have a crown that is temporary, and this is what Peter's saying, but you, you're going to receive a crown of glory that doesn't fade away, of being with Christ in his glory for eternity your reward is great in heaven, so remain faithful and one day hear that well done. And when you hear that, doesn't matter what you went through, doesn't matter how much pain, doesn't matter how many tears, doesn't matter how much suffering, doesn't matter all the affliction, doesn't matter the persecution. That means nothing when it's all swallowed up by the glory of Jesus Christ. And that's what you're working for. Keep that in mind.